Okay, so today is Monday, October 19th, and I'm going to pick up on the material on the uh, constraint up. I want to do the uh, total variation regularization using ADMM because that's a, a, an important, like total variation regularization is useful. I think maybe some people think it's more useful than others. I mean, it's definitely good for certain things. It's not good for everything, but it's a great example of how to use these methods. So I want to go through it more from the point of view of it being uh, a great example. Now, uh, yeah, total variation. Okay. So the um, general concept is this. Oh, well, first of all, let me do this, because um, TV regularization. Did, did you guys try to read the notes? Like, not, you don't have to read it perfectly. Just at least skim it, OK? So the TV regularization is like the sum over IJ see, over you pixel pairs of B i j x i minus x j. So I wanted to illustrate, and I didn't think, I mean, it's a little tricky. If I do this formally correct, maybe it's not so clear. So I'm going to emphasize clarity here rather than precision. And I'm going to do a simple little example just to illustrate the fact that you can always write this in the following form. B x like this for some b. Why? OK, that may not be obvious. It's sort of being obvious to me because I've been in this business too long, OK? When you do something for a long time, it's like really obvious. So imagine that you have like this. You have like x1, x2, x3, x4. So you have a four pixel image, OK? And we're going to do anisotropic total variation using a circular boundary condition. So you'd have like uh, x1 minus x2 times b12, right? And it's plus x b1, uh, I don't know, b1, uh, b, I don't know, prime 1, 2, I guess I'll make it x1 minus x3 plus uh, b12 times x2 minus x1, okay, right, plus b uh, prime 1, 2, x2 minus x4 plus b12 x3 minus x4 plus b prime 1, 2 of x3 minus x1 plus b1, 2 x4 minus x3 plus b prime 1, 2 of x4 minus x2. Okay, you might say, what the heck are you writing up there, okay? I'm writing all the terms associated with this, this sum. Assuming I have four point nearest neighbors, uh, uh, okay, and um, I, I, I took a little liberty in the definition. I'm assuming it's homogeneous, okay? And then the B12 is the values. Well, maybe I'll just call this B1 and call this B2. In other words, what I'm just doing is I'm taking the absolute value of this difference the absolute value of that difference, OK? Then I use this as my anchor point. I move it here, and I take the absolute value of that difference, and then the absolute value of this difference, OK? Because oh, I'm doing a circular boundary condition. OK, so 
I'm looking, people are looking at me with blank stares, which indicates to me that I'm not really communicating clearly. OK, so first of all, do you remember what total variation is? The cost function? You just take the difference between neighboring pixels, you take their absolute value, OK? Forget the Bs, because they're not important, but they, well, they're important from an application. If you didn't have the Bs, it would be a problem. But they're not conceptually important, OK? They're just, they're just multiplying scalars, OK? So forget the Bs. The most important thing is you've got to take that difference, right? Then you have to take this difference, correct? Then you go over here to this one. You go, OK, I'll take that difference, right? And you take this difference, except for there's nothing there, right? So instead, you take this, because you wrap around, OK? Is that, Neil, is that clear? OK. So then you go here, is like that, right? And this, you go like this, right? So, you got, so there's, for each pixel, there's two terms, correct? No, I mean, we could do it. I'm just doing a silly example. This is not a proof of anything. It's an example. Because I decided I could prove it, but then I'd write all these crazy expressions out, and everybody would go like this. Okay, They wouldn't understand what the heck I'm talking about. It's easier if I just do an example. Then you get the idea, and I think it'll be clear that it generalizes. Okay. So for each pixel, we'll have two neighbors, right? Well, actually, they have four neighbors, but we only take the difference of two because of the symmetry. They'll all get counted when we're finished. So, because remember, we have every unique pair of differences. So if I only take the ones to the, it's like, if I only take the people it, it, to the left and, and ahead of me, you know, like, you ever do this thing where you, you want to space out with people uniformly, so you, you like you space yourself relative to the person ahead and to the left, and then the person to your left and behind you spaces, so it all works out, right? Okay. So for, well, there's two terms associated with each pixel. There are four pixels. There are eight terms. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You got it. The point is this. If I did the following, so, OK, if I have, OK, I call y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, y6, y7, y8, right? Maybe I should have started at 0 and gone to 7. I don't know. There's, there's, there's eight terms corresponding to those ter eight terms, right? So to compute those eight terms, so this is a vector, right? Over here is x1, x2, x3, x4. Oh, we only have four inputs. That's easy. That's right. Which illustrates a very important fact about what I'm about to do, which is this matrix B is not square. It's not square. It's much taller than it is wide. This is the matrix B, OK? So for y1, I need to compute x1 minus x2, correct? So I have 1, 0, oh, 1 minus 1, 0, 0. But I really should multiply by b, b, the thing I call b1, right? So I could actually make it b1 minus b1. Does that make sense? Then for this one, I have what? x1 minus x3. So it's b2. Oh, let's just make it b. Let's make all the b's the same. Can I just make all the b's the same? I'm just trying to do a simple example to make it clear how this works. OK, do you believe me? 
Because, uh, you know, why make vertical differences different than horizontal ones? So this is minus b, 0, 0, right? And then this next one, y3, is what? x2 minus x1, right? So this is b minus b, like that, right? Is that right? They can't possibly be right. I messed it up. x2. Oh, that is right, <laughs> which is stupid, OK? Because it, yeah. If it was a larger problem, this wouldn't happen. The problem is that because it's 2 by 2, it's kind of wrapped around in a funny way. OK, and then this is 0, 0. And then what's x? What's y4? Can you guys help me out by calling it out? x2 minus x4. x2 minus x4. So this is b minus b, 0, 0. What's the next one? Huh? x3 minus x4. So x3 is b minus b, right? OK. x3 minus x4. x3. And what's the x4 minus x3. Or no, x2. X1, so it's b minus b like this? No, x4 minus x2. Oh. OK. Now, is this is b. Now, is b times x that over there? No. b minus x is this, but without the absolute value, right? So then I do, but remember, if I take, if I take y, what is the definition of that? It's just the sum from i equals 1 to whatever, 8, of y, i, absolute value, right? So this is going to be exactly that, OK? What is my point? My point is that you can always represent a total variation regularization problem this way. OK? But the B matrix here is tall and thin. In fact, if it's a um, if it's a two point if it's a four point neighborhood, it'll be approximately twice as tall as it is wide. If it's an eight point neighborhood, it'll be four times as tall as it is wide. If it's an endpoint neighborhood, it'll be n over two times as tall. Modulo the boundary condition, which can add some little weirdnesses. Okay? Is everybody good with this? Do you understand that? This concept. So for now on, instead of writing all this complicated stuff, I'll just write b times x like this, okay? Without loss of generality. OK. That's the number one most important thing first. OK, now, so that's total variation. We're going to come back to it in just a minute. So now, um, you want to minimize you want to minimize f of x plus you have OK, we're going to have g of b of x, like this. Yeah, this is the general problem. Uh, before, I just had g of x. I, just, I actually had h of x, OK? But now I add a little additional glitch, twist, you might say, by putting a b in here. And obviously, where we're going with this is it's going to be v x like this, correct? You see where I'm going, OK? So the question is, but this is a general class of problems. How do we solve it with the techniques we had? You constrain, you, what would you do is this. You do a splitting problem. Where v equals subject to the constraint v equals, before we had v equals x. Now we're going to have v equals bx. 
and this is going to be all we really care about is x. Okay, and this is going to be uh, f of x plus. Now this is going to be g of v because v equals b x. Okay, and then we're going to have plus uh, the norm of what we'll have is x plus b v. Oh no, I got it mixed up. V plus or V minus BX plus U squared. Because our constraint is that V equals that V minus BX equals zero. That's our constraint. Okay? The rest of it's all the same. When we do ADMM, we minimize with respect to just x and v independently. Okay, so uh, so we have that some um, we said repeat. You have that uh, x goes to, um, uh, right, you go, yeah, you have uh, uh, arg min over x, right, of, uh, let me just do it from here so I don't mess this up. So I guess I, what I was doing it was like this. F of x. This becomes bx minus v minus u. Oh, did I use uh, my notes? I hope my notes are correct. Uh, they probably are. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, I just, in my notes, I wrote it the other way around. I mean, it's equivalent. But let me stick to how the notes are. I wrote Bx minus V. I just want to make it align with the notes so it's not confusing for you. <coughs> so this becomes a plus. And then uh, D hat um, B hat goes to arg min over v of um, g of v plus a over 2 norm of bx. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this around. I'm going to make it v minus bx minus u. I guess I could make it like this. I can also make this like that. And then what ends up happening is to handle this thing, I go that u goes to u plus bx minus v. And these are hatted quantities. So this is the ADMM algorithm for solving this problem. Now, it's still not entirely clear that this is much easier. Uh, the question is, is it easier to do these optimizations now? This, I can do this optimization, OK? Um, because I can, well, in practice, I mean, because this is a quadratic optimization problem, so we, 
have all that previous sections that we learned on how to solve this problem. It can be solved iteratively or in closed form in theory if this is quadratic, okay? If f is convex, I can solve this iteratively, okay? Then um, the, the question is this. So this is kind of interesting. So uh, remember that G of V now is just the L1 norm of, uh, of V. Why? Because remember we had that, we had G of Vx is equal to the norm of Vx. And this was the TV cost. But I, I, the way I defined G is I had B inside of G. So G really, I'll say Y, it's just the L1 norm, which is just the sum of the absolute value of the elements. So G is a relatively simple form here. And, and then, so now what happens is that if you have a problem of the form uh, arg min over V of the L1 norm of V plus a over 2 times the norm of V minus, I don't know, something. We'll call it Z because I'm running out of letters. Squared. The first thing to notice is that this quadratic norm, okay, so this might be getting a little, do we need to take a slight break here? Does everybody remember what we're doing here? We're solving this problem. Okay, so now we need, this is the, the there's two steps, the quadratic step and this is the, the, we're trying to solve the TV optimization problem, which is not continuously differentiable, so it's tricky. We're hoping that this, this optimization is gonna be simple now. So this is what we're doing, okay? This is the minimum. Remember, V1 is equal to the sum over, say, I of the absolute value of V, V, I, right? And, and V minus Z squared is equal to the sum over I of V I minus Z I squared. So my point is this, this whole thing here is the sum over I of, uh, vi squared, uh, I'm sorry, vi absolute value plus a over 2 uh, vi minus zi squared. So I can minimize with respect to each term individually because they don't interact. Does that make sense? Ask a question if you're confused. So you're, yeah. Don't they interact in the squared term? The in the what? The VI, ZI is paired. No, because this is a, you're minimizing over V. Oh, I see. So Z is a constant. Okay. So there's no interaction. Sure. So it turns out if you minimize a function like this, what is it happening? You have something which is quadratic and it's centered around ZI. This is ZI, okay? It's a quadratic function centered around zi. But now you're adding a function which looks like this. And there's some weighting, okay? So what happens is that if zi is far enough away, okay, then the, okay, if zi is close, the solution is going to be at that, at the zero. But if zi is far enough away, eventually the function the solution is not going to be zero. Because what happens is that <laughs> the effect, essentially what happens is that eventually the derivative at this zero here becomes larger than the positive derivative here, and the thing starts getting pulled away. 
the solution, <laughs> the solution to this problem looks like this. It's the so-called shrinkage function. Okay? And the threshold here is what? Uh, so there's a whole section on the shrinkage function. Just so that, okay. Um, that's the shrinkage function, okay? So the answer ends up becoming Uh, this thing here, um, This is causation for minimization with a concrete constraint. Uh, I guess the I don't have an actual. Oh, here it is. It, uh, figure nine point six has the algorithm. You solve this thing. This uh, this is a little messy, but I'll do it to save time. I'm going to erase this and replace it with the simplified answer. It turns out this thing here simplifies. And it comes out to be S1 over A of Bx plus U. This is the shrinkage function, which just takes each component and applies that operation to it. And I think this is the threshold, 1 over A. I was pretty sure that's how it works. Let me just double check that. Yeah, okay. And it's for lambda equals one, yes. Okay, correct. That's, uh, that's correct. So the beauty of it is now, the algorithm is pretty simple. You solve this optimization problem. Bs look like, it's almost like you have quadratic regularization instead of this total variation thing. Then you take B plus U and you shrink it. And then you update U and you repeat. And if you stare at this thing long enough, it kind of makes sense, okay? But this is how you do it, and this, this is actually the most, so this is how you solve total variation regularization problems, because they're not continuously differentiable. So it's not really effective to, gradient descent isn't really appropriate, although people do gradient descent anyway, they just make weird approximations sometimes. I mean, great, as people in deep learning can tell you, gradient descent works for everything, okay, even though it's not really correct. But this is the correct way of actually solving the problem. And, um, and then, of course, you can use this for, you can use ADMM for solving all kinds of other problems. In general, you can use it for solving general problems of convex constraints on convex optimization problems by using the same kind of a technique, okay? But the next section we'll go to is, excuse me? Yeah, plug and play, which is how we're now going to use this kind of stuff in some kind of magical way to get uh, the idea in plug and play is that it's a way of merging together algorithms like we learned in this class so far with the evil of deep learning, okay, or other kinds of non-parametric um, estimation techniques. So it's a way of mixing and matching. It's a way of having your cake and eat it too, okay? So uh, we'll talk about that next time. All right, thanks a lot. Bye.